Hello, everyone. Welcome to LA Community Connections. My name is Danny Romero. I'm with ABC7 here in Los Angeles, and we're bringing you a great show here today. Uh, let me tell you first about Community Connections, what this is all about. It's a, a, a virtual town hall series that's designed to educate and inform along with providing access to leaders in and around lung health and clean air. Now, our goal of today's session is to arm you with reliable information about clean air and clean energy. Let me tell you a few things here. The American Lung Association's most recent state of the air report finds that after decades of progress on cleaning up sources of air pollution, nearly 36% of Americans, that's 119.6 million people, still live in places with failing grades for unhealthy levels of ozone and particle pollution. Now, overall, that is 17.6 million people fewer breathing unhealthy air compared to last year's report. So that's not good news. Now, uh, the, uh, the improvement that we've seen, this is the good news part, was seen in falling levels of ozone in many places around the country, the continuation of a positive trend that reflects the success of the Clean Air Act. So this is good. We're going the right direction here. However, the number of people living in kinds of failing grades for daily spikes and daily uh, particle pollution was 63.7 million, the most ever reported under the current national trend. Here's something else really important. That said, people of color are 3.7 times more likely than white people to live in a county with three failing grades. That's not good news. Now, let me give you an example. Bakersfield, California displaced Fresno, California as the metropolitan area with the worst short-term particle pollution, while Bakersfield continuing the most polluted slot for year-round particle pollution that tied this year with Visalia, California. You notice a pattern here, right? Uh, Los Angeles remains a city with the worst ozone pollution in the nation, as it has for all but one of the 24 years tracked by the State of the Air report. So, uh, so there's obviously things we have to do to cover things here. Now, the American Lung Association is working to make transportation pollution free across the country. We're going to discuss some of those things here in our program uh, as we move along in the next hour or so. So we're going to give you some information that you really need to, to have. And to help you do that, we brought together a great panel here of industry leaders to discuss what is happening now, what to expect moving forward, and how we can best prepare our, for ourselves and our families. So let me introduce our, our panel to you today. Uh, first up, we have the Customer Program and Services of Southern California Edison's Senior Manager, I should say, of the Program Design Development Team in Southern California Edison's Customer Programs and Services Organization. His team focuses on designing programs and services for SCE's customers that will advance the development of clean energy solutions with specific focus on transportation and building electrification. This guy is a great guy. He's an engineer by training. And prior to joining SCE in 2019, he spent over a decade designing emissions control systems for power plants and petrochemical facilities, and then went on to manage the development of multiple lithium ion based energy storage products. Moved to California in 2007, has lived in Ontario since 2011. Here's Aaron R. Dyer. Hello, Aaron. Thanks for being with us today. Well, thanks, Danny. Nice to be here. Um, and yeah, as, as you mentioned, the uh, kind of living in the Inland Empire since 2007, really working in air quality. Yeah. I think you said some great things that, you know, we have been improving, you know, over the last, you know, several 15, you know, 20 years or so, like you can see it in the air, but you can also see some slipping, you know, as we get more last mile deliveries, as you know, yeah. port traffic has increased, yeah. um, but we've got much better tools now to address yeah. the problem than we did 15, 20 years ago. And it's really right. exciting to be in the space. Right. To be able it is, to it is. Yeah. I mean, it's something we've got lots we can cover on that too. Uh, and we do it with our, with our next panelist here also. Our next panelist is the host of Environmental Social Justice and the Chief Climate Risk and Communications Officer for Navigating Gray, uh, and has been an environmental subject matter expert and the host of Environmental Social Justice. Uh, and she has worked in the environmental risk industry, uh, management industry for over 20 years uh, before transitioning to focuses on sustainability, social justice, and socioeconomic impact in 2018. Now, in addition to her role with Navigating Gray, she is a commissioner with the city of Beverly Hills and sits on several boards and committees. And this is Wendy E. Nystrom. Wendy, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. And um, yeah, my back, I have a unique background. I'm a geologist, geochemist by degree, and I was actually in the field. So I got to see contamination and pollution firsthand yeah. before going into risk management and ultimately focusing on social justice and socioeconomic impact. 
Yeah, so that's great stuff. So, so and before we even get started here, give me a, a little something like uh, with you, Aaron, first, like, give me a little something I didn't mention in the intro that uh, you want people to know about you. Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I think, like as I, as I said, I mean, I think it's been really interesting to see, you know, firsthand out here kind of on the ground, you know, in the Inland Empire with the deployment of, you know, the warehousing space and kind of what that's done, you know, both from a air right. quality perspective, but also from, you know, just how it's changed communities. I'm, I'm an avid cyclist and just kind of the, the ah. increase of traffic is, uh, you know, interesting. It's made navigating the roads a little more challenging, but I think uh, there's going to be some, you know, solutions to that in the future as well. Yeah. And what, what about you, Wendy? What gives a little something more about you? Um, avid swimmer, swim in the Pacific Ocean when it's not oh, freezing really? outside. So. Okay. <laughs> That's right. Uh, with with the wetsuit to keep you warm? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay, LA Tri Club. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah Chosen yeah. at 630. Um, heavy. So I love the fact that Aaron's an avid cyclist. That's fantastic. And yeah, we both have backgrounds of firsthand knowledge of what is going on yeah. out there. Yeah. Well, let's let's talk about some of that stuff. Let's uh, start with you, Aaron. Tell us um, what what is SCE doing to uh, support clean uh, and clean air, clean energy? It's kind of an overall look here. Just an easy question, right? We'll get that one out of the way uh, no. soon. The, um, no, the, uh, you know, the electric grid is going to be kind of the backbone of any clean energy transition uh, going forward as electricity provides a clean, reliable fuel, you know, for all the you know, alternative options that we have out there. Right, right. You know, internal projections show that by 2045, for example, you know, we're going to be an 80% increase in electrical load in the system that's due largely to vehicles, but also to shifting away from, you know, combusting gas in our homes for for heating and, and water heating. And that's going to come with a lot of extra work that, that we've got to do. And so we've got a lot of advanced planning teams uh, that are working, you know, pr pretty much nonstop on, you know, trying to determine when and where uh, we need to be deploying grid infrastructure uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we are staying ahead of that curve, uh, that we can deploy the grid at time, you know, in a timely way to make sure that we can energize these these new loads when, when they're needed. That's kind of on the grid planning side, which is kind of the, the big picture thing that we do you know, as a core business, but getting into sort of the work that, that my team does to make sure that our, you know, customers can afford to do this. Right. Uh, entire program teams dedicated to, you know, trying to make sure that lower income folks, people that live in disadvantaged communities, like the ones that you mentioned that are the most impacted by, by air quality, mm -hmm. you know, can have affordable and equal access to, uh, you know, the types of technologies that are going to be, you know, creating these solutions. So we run a number of income-based uh, EV rebate programs. We've got, you know, building electrification programs that are really focused on getting, you know, heat pumps, air conditioning systems, you know, efficient appliances into the lower, yeah. lower income folks' homes. We do a number of, you know, bill, bill assistance programs and, and those sort of things, but really quite a bit going on both at the, the individual level, but also at, you know, kind of the commercial businesses that are in these communities as well, trying to really help Push, push and pull from both ends, right? Get the get the grid ready, and also make sure that our our most underserved customers are able to come along for the ride. Yeah, I mean, you got to get all those components covered. Uh, uh, Wendy, in, in your intro, I talked about uh, uh, environmental justice. Uh, yes. Tell me what that is. What what environmental justice? What does it involve? Sure. Um, environmental justice um, has gained a lot of traction as a term in the last five or six years, mm -hmm. and um, generally it focuses on the positive and negative effects that different um, environmental environmental factors have on communities and individuals. So what does that mean? Um, if you are living near a power plant and there's a smokestack and that smokestack is producing burnt petroleum and that is going to rain down on a community around you, that is not healthy for that community. You're going to inhale that, that's going, you know, you're going to breathe that in and you're going to have detrimental health effects from that. So the environmental justice aspect is trying to address that situation and find green alternatives where you are not exposing people to that contamination, to that pollution. Um, that being said, a lot of people do confuse environmental justice with social justice. Social justice is what is fair treatment in the workplace for individuals and groups. Um, so a lot of people use those interchangeably. I just want to clarify, environmental justice is the environment around you that you are exposed to any negative effects around you. Um, so that's generally what we are trying to address in today's. And when Aaron was talking about heat pumps, that is an environmental justice thing. It's that's equity to pay your bills and help you. So that's what SoCal Edison's involvement is in that as well. Oh, okay. Well, and another thing for you, uh, Wendy, uh, kind of touching on this a little bit, um, energy resilience. Yes. What is that? How do we get there? Kind of give us a little kind of a little roadway there. Yeah, you got to love terminology that we all have. We all have our different terms and yeah, acronyms. Yeah. And I try, I personally try to avoid acronyms and jargon. So I try to speak very simply. So as simply as I can put it, um, energy resilience is talking about, um, it's the resilience to anticipate or adapt and recover from a disruptive incident. So what does that mean? So let's say we have an earthquake 
or we have a storm or we have high wind and your primary source of energy is cut off, you want to have some alternative that you can go to that is green renewable energy. Currently, most people are going to go to a generator, which is usually diesel powered. It's great to get your electricity back on, especially if there are medical needs, but it's not great for the environment. Right. So we are trying to build energy resilience where you have access to an alternative form. And there are many ways. Um, SoCal Edison's doing a great job with their electrical grid, enforcing their, their infrastructure. But we also need to build out something called microgrids. So when an event like that happens, an entire community won't go dark. It'll just be a smaller section because you have these little electrical resources that are spotted throughout your community rather than one big one. Oh. And then depending on your geography or where you are, or what makes sense, mm -hmm. you could have things like hydrogen come in, hydrogen power. You could have your energy come from wind and solar. We always have to think about diversification of energy, what's available to you, what makes sense for you. And that's also kind of based on kind of area where you are too. Yeah, would that be kind of part of it too? That's yeah. your geography. And what you're obsessed what to. Yeah. yeah, what makes sense and works best for your area. Yeah. Um, uh, another big thing going on, and, and in fact, I kind of have to, uh, on a personal note, uh, let you guys know I feel good about this. I, I now have an electric vehicle. After years of, uh, of of not, you know, gasoline and stuff, and uh, I now have an electric vehicle. And so let's talk about that because I, I know I'm kind of, you know, you know, every once in a while, I go, okay, uh, let's let's find out about this, the EV, the EV charging station situation. Um, uh, so Aaron, give me an idea. What, uh, what do you tell us about charging stations for EV, their availability, accessibility? Uh, programs you have, all that. Give me an idea what what, what we got going for uh, for uh, EV people like me now. Oh my gosh! Well, welcome to the club, Danny. There you really, go. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Uh, the uh, and I think you know there's a lot to say here about EVs and EV charging stations. We um, California is you know leading the nation in per capita EV charging stations. You know they're at least maybe not per capita, but the most the most EV charging stations that we have there. Oh, wow. uh, that's been you know a long dedicated process. Uh, you know a lot of effort over the last decade. Uh, we've got a long way to go, but I think uh, we're just over sort of 10,000 uh, public DC fast charging uh, ports. If you check the California Energy Commission's website, um, and a lot of that's due been to you know some of the investments that the utilities have made. We've been running a number of you know infrastructure rebate programs where we will pay for the deployment of those charging stations. The most of those have been really focused at uh, businesses, multifamily complexes, and you know like bus fleets, those sort of things. Less than the the right. public available charging. Though you've seen a, a big influx of um, you know money coming uh, from the uh, was it the Investment Infrastructure and Jobs Act IAJA back in 2021. Oh. That, uh, speaking of acronyms, Wendy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> we got <laughs> a bunch of them today. Don't yeah. work at the facility and let's not work at the federal government. But you're right. I actually think there was this announcement on you know Friday, I believe, that the uh, California Energy Commission, for example, have been granted I think 63 million dollars of federal funding through the IAJA to help. Uh, deploy more and fix current EV charging stations in the state. So I think there's there's a lot going on there that both the utilities are doing, to continue providing infrastructure support, uh, as well as you know the state, the federal government, uh, kind of everybody is really uh, you know all hands on deck to kind of you know keep deploying, make sure that the infrastructure that we have is reliable, working, and, you know can be you know, can can be counted on to to you know be there when you need it. Um, and I also want to want to kind of always plug this. So forgive me yeah. for going a little bit longer on no, this no. one, but I think as as a new EV owner, this is useful for you as well. Is like yeah. we've been sort of ingrained over the you know the course of however long we've been driving mm -hmm. that you have to go take your car somewhere to fuel. Um, and you know, I mean, yes, there there are plenty of folks that live in apartment complexes or don't have street you know off street parking where charging is a real challenge. But for a majority of Californians, and I believe about sixty to seventy percent of our customers live in a single family home. Um, you know, plugging in in your driveway overnight is a very cost effective, easy, convenient way to charge that really takes care of most of your daily driving needs without additional support. Right. And so I'm always I'm always a little head scratching when I see people that that probably have home access, maybe, you know, parked at a, a public DC fast charger when they might be doing that at home. I, mean, I think uh, in the two years I've had an EV now. Yeah. I can probably count on both hands the amount of times I've used a public charger uh, just because it's because, he, yeah, it's, just, it's easier just to do it in my driveway when I'm sleeping and, and don't need to worry about it. So, right. I mean, so so if, if someone is is kind of making a decision about going to some charging station or doing it at home, if they have the facilities thereof, better to do it at home then. Is that right? Oh, cer certainly it's cheaper. You can you can. It's cheap. OK, that's my next question. Is, is the cost yeah. effective? 
Yeah, it, it's way cheaper to do it at home. Generally speaking, um, it's a little bit you can you can manage it better. So it's generally less uh, taxing on the grid if you can do it, you know, slower for more hours overnight. Right. Um, I just you know tend to think about, you know, no one likes going to a gas station. I, I can't think of the last time that I said I'm looking forward to going standing there. And, oh, you know, boy. Smelling the fumes and, you know, right. watching people walk by and, and do those sort of things. And uh, and it has to be quick at a gas station because no one wants to be there. But when you can just park your car at your work or at your home or, wow. you know, if, if movie theaters would be a good place for these things. Also, yeah. uh, we've been thinking about that. I mean, we're, wherever you can do it, where you're doing something you want to do and the right. car's just taking care of itself, yeah. that's the ideal yeah. situation. It's kind of like doing two things at one time, right? Uh, okay, so, so that's kind of like, you know, private vehicle and stuff. Um, let's talk about what... Uh, uh, SCE SC is doing to uh, help get to zero emission with uh, commercial trucking, the mm -hmm. commercial trucking space. What's what's going on there? Well, correct. So we, we've been running a program since 2018 called Charge Ready Transport, which is about a $350 million program that's really focused on getting fleets that maybe have their own, uh, I'll call it depot, like where they can take their trucks and, and mm -hmm. charge. Makes sense. So the idea there is to get about 8,500, you know, commercial trucks electrified over the next several years. That's going to dovetail into a couple other programs that are getting ready to launch. Uh, one is the uh, Transportation Electrification Framework Funding Cycle 1, which the CPUC has uh, authorized the IOUs, the, I'm sorry, the investor-owned utilities. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to get stuck here. Sorry. <laughs> That's a, uh, well, long as you, if you use them to explain them, that's all no, we need. No, no. It's okay. The, uh, we have the time. The, yeah, authorize us to run that over the next part of the decade, which will continue to provide rebates for, uh, I guess, customer side equipment to help them deploy, you know, their charging stations, any electrical upgrades they have to do to their facility to deploy charging stations on their, on their property. We also are getting ready to launch uh, complementary to many of the statewide programs that the Air Resources Board runs uh, for commercial trucking. A, uh, a rebate for drayage trucks. I say that's a that's a very peculiar word, but those are the trucks that do short haul operations in and out oh. of the port. You know, carrying all the all the container ships. You know, oh, okay. all the, yeah, that's what you they're called. Those, I never knew that. Yeah, drayage. Right? It's, a, it's a very strange word. It, it looks funny. It sounds funny. Um, but it is a. It's very specifically those heavy duty tractors that will pull the containers. You know, in and out of the port. Right. Uh, those trucks on a on a daily basis or not a daily basis, but annually. Because they drive so much. I mean, one of those one sure. of those trucks drives about sixty thousand miles a year. Really? That, yeah. And so what that means is that one of those creates as much pollutants for the air, like the stuff that we've been talking about that you're breathing in, the the you know particulate matter, the NOx emissions, as about one hundred and eighty passenger cars. It's, it's it's a real it's a re, they're really you know in addition to you know the brake dust and you know to you know the diesel particulate emissions, which are known carcinogens, which don't exist with gasoline cars, and so. They're really, really not great for a lot of our communities yeah, and yeah. environment. So uh, the Air Resource Board is focused on that. We're going to be bringing forth a rebate that is, I'm going to get the number wrong, but it, it should be $150,000 off the purchase price of one of those vehicles for, for customers that, that are looking to buy those. Again, in conjunction with their infrastructure programs that we're really trying to provide, you know, um, you know, start to finish, you know, turn tail solutions for our customers that are uh, you know, looking to, um, to electrify their fleets. Right now, um, now that that you gave us a lot of data there. Now, Wendy, ask you how, how give us an idea about um, you know the importance of data and just kind of you mentioned that that too about what what data is used and what we give me give a little background on that. Sure. Um, so, being a scientist, and I'm going to bring out the science nerd in me. You can never have enough. Please data. do help us data, out. Data is so important for anything that you do. You need when we were talking earlier about what system is right for your area, what geography you have, what your community needs. You can't guess that. You can't estimate that. You can't have right. a one size fits all for that. You need to have granular data of what that community needs, what that neighborhood wants, who's going to be more at risk, who oh. is more at risk for losing their their electrical resources, um, who's you know who may lose their power, and then where the alternative power resources make sense. If you live in an area yeah. that has high wind, great, wind probably will work for you. Or you might be in a place where geothermal works great. So you need to know what that kind of information is and who's at risk and what works because certain communities are going to have different needs. Um, there's a great story I like to tell people is like 20, 25 years ago, London installed solar paneled parking meters. Now, back then, solar panels weren't as strong as they are now. And London is known for having many cloudy days. So the solar paneled parking meters didn't work that well. Really? They couldn't charge because they weren't pulling that. No one, no one looked into the data of will this make sense for our neighborhood? 
Well, yeah, I mean, because I mean, the sun is still there, but the cloud cover was there. enough that it still kind of impacted. Well, the, this was about 20, 30 years ago oh, where okay. the, the panels weren't as good as they are now. Right. And it was a great theory, a fantastic idea, made absolute sense. Yeah. It just the tech wasn't there yet. So that's why we need to pull that data and find out what works for your community. Who's the most at risk? Where does this make sense? And um, that's what, you know, you need that. I just keep using the word granular over and over again. Yeah, yeah. We can't make educated guesses anymore. We have to get into that specifics and find out what works. Yeah. And then and, and that's, and that's the area where you said that's where your data comes in handy and you got that. Um, you know, we, now we, we've had opened up people are, are, are watching this and they're sending questions. I got a few for you coming in from, uh, from some viewers here. So if you guys can help us out here. So uh, Aaron, now this one's for you. Um, a question from, from a viewer saying, uh, I live in a condo in West Hollywood and it's been very challenging to gain EV charging in my building. We were talking about this. Uh, it is costly, seems out of reach. Uh, what resources are out there for us? Uh, I guess the, you know, living in a condo in, in uh, WeHo or just any place for that matter. Well, and forgive me for going down a little bit of a, a bunny trail here, uh, Danny. Please do. <laughs> want to educate folks a little bit on kind of like where some of those bottlenecks can be if, if it's challenging. I mean, so there's everyone sort of thinks, you know, if you haven't worked at a utility, you'd have no reason not to think this way, um, that the grid's just kind of there because that's, that's what your expectation is, is to kind of be there and be ready. And there's, but there's really two sides of like what you see as an electrical customer, right? There's the, right. there's like from the pole to your home, to your building, you know, to your facility and kind of that component of it and the stuff, you know, on, that you do inside right. your house. Right. Kind of mini and then there's the upstream stuff, the stuff, you know, beyond the pole that kind of goes back up, you know, towards the substations, distribution network, you know, the, the power plants all the, all the way up. Now, as I mentioned, there's a, a number of utility programs. We've got them. LA Department of Water and Power has them. They're really focused on getting that, uh, um, you know, pole to home infrastructure upgraded for charging stations. There's a number of rebates that are out there, whether that's for charging stations, for uh, panel upgrades, for if you're living like a single family home, whether that's, you know, I think like our neighbors to the north, for example, PG&E have a, um, a low port count condominium like electrical upgrade incentive. So if you live uh -huh. on like a fourplex or a duplex, you can have some work to for, for TE charging. Right. There's a lot out there that you can you know, go to your utility website and you know find some rebates for you. Or or if you're the you know landlord, you can find those. On the upstream side of it, it's a little more tricky because a lot of times those planning processes develop you know regional grids to some of the you know, things that Wendy was talking about before in terms of like locational and you know specific can take five to 10 years sometimes of planning oh, and deployment. Wow. And really? Yeah. And so that, though that's, a, you know, we, we, and this is a really, it's a very rigorous process that we go through with the California public utilities commission, you know, on an, on kind of a four-year cycle, it's called our general rate case where we go out and we get to, we get to using some forecast for, you know, how much electricity is going to be in the system. We say, Hey, based on that, we think we need this much grid to, um, to, you know, build out the system and to, um, you know, to make sure that we can, you know, support the load that's going to happen. So mm -hmm. we submit this, it's reviewed for, you know, the right reasons, cost effectiveness, and to make sure that, you know, we're, we're getting the best value for our customers. But the challenge really that we're seeing now is that the load that is coming from EVs is much faster than the forecast can keep up with. So like, while really? like yeah, I mean, so like, I think about this, you know, we have double like in the last decade we've doubled the amount of solar you know that we've ever installed we've done or more than that actually we've gone from potentially 10,000 EVs on the road you know in the last 10 years to 1.3 million EVs in the last road in the last 10 years and that number is going to double in the next two years and then double again a year after that so right. I mean so what happened and I don't think anybody would have thought we would have been there you know four or five years ago during the last planning cycle so the challenge becomes that how do you get ahead of this um this growth curve so that you can build out the grid to support this upcoming load, because we just haven't seen this type of load growth really since air conditioners were, you know, uh, kind of populating themselves yeah. back in the sixties. And that really kind of builds up something Wendy said, which is data, data, data. And, you know, it's getting data from our customers, yeah. you know, what are your electrification plans? When do you think you're going to be buying those trucks? Like, when do you think, you know, this is going to show up? We're getting some help from the state regulators that are, you know, regulating a lot of businesses to help, you know, encourage electrification. So that kind of set the timeline. Right. But, but it's it is a real uh, challenge to make sure that we have the right data, that we have the right plans and the right forecast, because those build into things that we, you know, are applying for now right. that we may be authorized in a couple of years that will then will get deployed and, you know, in five or six. And I mean, you tell me if, if you thought we'd be here where we are today, six years ago. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's a real I mean. Thing. 
Yes, and and that that's kind of it's it's like you know good news bad bad news right we we are it's nice to know that that many people in that shorter time are getting the idea about clean energy about you know making this shift away uh, towards a, a cleaner uh, kind of energy use uh, idea or style of life anyway uh, but yeah well, then the infrastructure got to keep up with it it's, it's like kind of I I think about it in terms of like our, our our freeways you know here in California like you you see construction on the freeway going on to to widen the freeway right because there's so much traffic by the time that project is done it's got well, you still need two more lanes, you know? So it's it's kind of the idea of trying to get ahead of where you see that growth happening is what you're talking about there. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, again, good problem to have, you know, but uh, just the same thing, you know, what do you, what do you, you know, do to plan ahead? Um, and um, and Wendy too, I got one for you here from, from one of our viewers. Uh, they want to know your thoughts about uh, air purifiers to improve indoor air quality, Wendy. Um, air purifiers are fantastic. Um, they they remove about almost 100% of the dust and pollen bacteria that's um, in the atmosphere that you're breathing in. And by reducing that exposure, it is ultimately going to improve your health benefits. Mm -hmm. But I have to absolutely stress one thing about air purifiers. A lot of them come, the, the filter themselves come with right. a plastic coating. You got to remove that plastic coating. That's a protective coating on the filter before you start running it. Oh, really? So make sure you just remove that plastic coating. You also have to change the filter or clean the filter as needed. And um, you want to make sure you look, you do an online research, find out what purifiers are better than others and also consume less energy because you don't want something that's going to jack up your electric bill. Sure. Um, so you have to do a little bit of research, find out what the ratings are and just keep it clean. And um, most importantly, don't shove it in a corner. You want it about oh. two or three feet away from any walls because it is circulating the air around you. Right, so you right. want to make sure it has that ability to do so. But air oh, purifiers are fantastic. My father-in-law um, has several around the house. Uh, well, that's that's a clean house inside, then, isn't it? Oh yeah, he you, he you is know a, the air is good. Very, yeah, he's he's very cognizant of his health, so he has a lot of air purifiers around the house. <laughs> As we all should be cognizant. Um, here's another one from a from an online viewer here. Um, maybe Aaron, you can handle this. What about electric uh, insecurity? Uh, this person has a fear and anxiety that I won't be able to charge my car in an emergency or bad weather. What advice do you have for that? Well, this well, I appreciate that question too. And it brings out, I wanted to kind of circle back on some of the conversation that, that Wendy was bringing up earlier about microgridding and sort of grid segmentation is uh -huh. that's something that we put a lot of thought into as well. Uh, we put out a, a white paper a couple years back now called Reimagining the Grid. And it really talks about like, there are certainly segments of our, of our service territory, a service area that are, uh, you know, more islanded than others let's put it that way or you know need have you know the, are easier to get cut off or you know or maybe not they can you know rely on other things but one thing that i think the the grid has done over the last several years and it has done is it used to be sort of you know power plant poles your home and it's very linear in the flow right but with uh you know rooftop solar with batteries being deployed at people's homes you know with um you know heck with evs you know there's a potential for evs to be able to be generation sources as well where you can plug the EV back into the grid and like have it export electricity back is what's what's emerging is really a, a grid that is somewhat bi-directional where you can have power nodes in different places and so what that lets us do as a system operator is really you know isolate uh, power outages to very specific regions and like not disrupt the, you know the grid you know you know full scale so again with with EVs uh I think our average customer, well, we certainly do have outages. I think last year, the average outage that a customer experienced was somewhere less than two hours. And so what that means is that, you know, in that time frame, especially if it's overnight, like, you know, mm -hmm. that may be 14 to 20 miles of charge that you might have on your car. Like, it's not the end of the world, especially if right. you charge, you know, overnight. Now, for the folks that may be more, more reliant on public charging, you know, there's a, a lot of EV charging stations now are being installed with uh, battery energy storage on site with the charging stations so that they can oh, wow. do a lot of things with that. They can, you know, keep costs more flat. They can also use that to, you know, provide charging services when the grid, you know, maybe is having some some difficulty. And so a lot of things like that are, are op opportunities, you know, to do this. But again, I, I think the going back to my previous point about, you know, kind of myths about charging is that you know, keeping your car kind of charged slowly all the time sort of mitigates that need for it. And, you know, it's a, you know, we have a similar problem now if the grid were to go down with gas stations, pumps don't work particularly well when, when there's no electricity there either. Uh, but the difference between an EV and a, and a gas, you know, an EV and a, and a gasoline car is you have to go somewhere to, you know, fill up. You could have been, you know, charging all the time at home. And again, 
given the way the grid has been segmented, you know, in recent years, continuing segmentation and, and grid hardening that we're doing, you may be, the grid may be perfectly operational a mile, two miles down the road from where you're at. And so you can just, if you really are in need, you know, keep, keep driving, you know, get to the next charging station as we start deploying, you know, more and more of these things out in public. Do, do you, do you recommend like, so, so if I'm hearing you right, recommend like keep keeping, like charging your car, like don't let your car battery run down too far. Like always kind of keep it at a, at a decent level. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and then, then you're going to start a, a fight online with me on Danny with this and forget for, for thinking about this and online. Oh, there, boy, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I'm, re I'm ready for it. There, there are a lot of um, differences of opinion about how you should keep your battery, like, you know, charged. And I think, you know, you want to defer to your, um, you know, vehicle manufacturer's recommendations on this. That's true. But a lot of the things that we think we know about batteries aren't necessarily true. I mean, I'm, I'm sure we all remember the old, you know, the old laptop batteries or the old device, but drain it all the way down before we recharge it. You know, that was kind of, you know, how you kept the battery healthy doesn't apply to modern car batteries. Like that, oh. that that's going to do that. You can keep them, you know, kind of in that 40 to 80 percent range and they're right. they're perfectly happy. Um, so just check with your, it, your online manual or uh, your, yeah, your yeah. manual, I guess. Yep. But yeah, they're, they're, they don't behave the way, you know, this isn't... Um, <laughs> This isn't your parents. Heck, this isn't our childhood battery for that matter. Yeah. It's not, not, not the battery we had grown up. And so I think they they are much more sophisticated and much more tolerant of um of operating in sort of a nice charge range. And yeah, yeah. I, I typically just keep mine, you know, once it gets to about 50%, I'll plug it back in and yeah. let it get back up because I never really know what I'm gonna do the next day. Yeah, I mean, there you go. Yeah, you want to surprise yourself, right? Uh yeah. here's one for you, Wendy. Uh another one came in from a uh, a mom. She says, as a mother, everything we hear about air quality seems so negative. Uh, yeah. I fear for my children's health and safety. What can I do? Is there light at the end of the tunnel? There is, there is absolutely light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I don't know. So a lot of people do have um, fear. A lot of people are scared about, you know, pollution, things going out there. One thing I always tell people to think about, if you go back to when everything shut down during the pandemic, when all of our manufacturing shut down, and that was a worldwide thing, all right. of a sudden we noticed that the skies were bluer the air was clearer and that was almost an immediate effect. So if you recall back to that, that immediate change, it's a perfect example of what we can accomplish. If we just stop burning petroleum and start stop creating that pollution, move to renewable energies, right. we can clear up our atmosphere very, very quickly yeah. and make things so much better for, for everyone. And please keep in mind that pollution doesn't respect borders. Pollution is just going to travel everywhere. So it's all of us in this together. This is not an individualistic. And what you can do, as, as what you guys can do, is ask your energy providers to offer renewable energy options. You know, make sure that they're using green energy. You can switch to other resources. Also, consume less. Um, I am sure I'm not the only one who had a father who would yell at them to turn off the lights and close the door to letting <laughs> heat out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... Keep that in mind. You don't have to consume as much as you think. Turn off lights, close the door, close the refrigerator, things like that. Those are the things you can do. Um, right. Also, you know, reach out to manufacturers or, you know, we we make decisions every single day with the money we spend. And you can look to people who manufacture with more ethical standards. Um, you can look under a background of what resources they use. Right. And um, I think most importantly, and this goes to everyone out there, please be gentle with yourself. This is going to take time, and there are many steps that we have to take. Yeah, yeah. So please be patient, but be steadfast. Yeah, yeah, stay on it, yeah. Um, there's another question in from a, one of our viewers here um, from Farah in Inglewood. Uh, is there a website where I can check for EV purchasing discounts? I guess, Aaron, would you know that? Well, yes, uh, there's probably more. There's probably so many out there that it actually adds to the confusion, I think, sometimes. Everybody wants yeah. their own website. I mean, we... Sure. Uh, your many of your utilities, SCE included, have our own um, kind of EV, you know, hub at their website. One of the best resources that I have seen, though, um, oh gosh, I'm going to get the dot wrong. It, it's Drive Clean CA. You see the dot org or dot com, but it's one. If you if you do Google search Drive Clean CA, okay. probably can't see Google search because that's a sponsorship thing or something. But if you if you search Drive right. Clean CA, you should be able to find them. They've done a pretty good job of keeping track of uh, you know kind of available incentives by your zip code. Right. Uh, now, whether you're eligible for them may depend upon, you know, household income or, you know, other types of, you know, you know, if you're in a utility district or you, you know, are participating as a, for a community choice aggregator, but they do a pretty good job of keeping track of the um, available uh, statewide incentives right now. Right. Um, um, 
Wendy, in, in, in terms of solar energy, what give, give me some ideas you've got about solar energy, you know, you know, its future. Um, is, is it? I, I, it depends on, on, you know, you may, need to make sure you put it in the appropriate places. Mm -hmm. um, so certain areas are going to be more resi resilient with respect to solar. It's going to fit well in areas. I love the fact that SoCal Edison is actually working with communities to put them on rooftops of buildings. Mm -hmm. right. They're working in those communities to either um, have a relationship with them where they get free energy out of it. But they're also putting them in microgrids. They're working with municipalities simultaneously. You know, other forms of energy are also great as well. But solar is probably the best option we have going forward. Um, mm -hmm. There are many, again, energy diversification is very important. But we have so much technology, data, and information behind the science of solar. It really is a great format. Right. Um, oh, you know, along those lines, another, another uh, viewer question here. Um, uh, someone writes in, uh, we live in the Coachella Valley, desert cities, uh, uh, Coachella Valley, desert cities and government sponsorship for home solar panels uh, isn't allowed in our zip code. Uh, and they say it seems ironic that this prime climate scenario, we're just talking about for solar, uh, is not included. And uh, the viewer says, sadly, the retail price tag to go it alone for private home solar remains very high. Are there any resources for me? Is the viewer's question? Uh, you got something on I that? I have to defer to Aaron. Now. Yeah, Aaron, what do you what do you say about that? Well, I'll be honest. I've never heard of um, you know zip codes sort of precluding the installation of a solar panel things. That mm -hmm. actually, and, and we can certainly look into that and see what that is. Yeah, they say um, Coachella Valley desert cities. Yeah. Yeah, um, that that one's interesting. So I, I think from from resource, you're right. It is very difficult to do it. Um, you know, on um, on your own. Oh. And um, I mean, I think there are a number of, you know, solar programs if you could, you know, but again, you have to participate in the that sort of, you know, needs participation and sort of allowed to be installed because the solar system is ultimately going to get, you know, connected to your home, you know, connected to the grid, uh, unless you were completely doing an off-grid system, which I, I think mentioned here was, you know, quite, quite expensive uh, yeah. in that yeah. regard. Um, what's interesting, though, I mean, this, this is a kind of a common thing that we see here, and I'll bring it back to maybe kind of some things that we do see as an industry, yeah. um, you know, Permitting, soft cost, installation costs really are kind of the driver that, you know, makes a lot of these things, you know, more expensive than so it should be. Right. Um, Wendy was talking about the the great proliferation of solar. I mean, I think I just saw an International Energy Agency report just last, again, last month that I think by 2030, wind and solar are going to make up 40% of the global electrical supply, which is astounding. I would never, I wouldn't have thought we would have been there, you know, five or six years ago. Right. Solar panels are really cheap, but yet we here in the United States pay maybe double to three times the cost of what a similar economy, say Australia does to install rooftop solar. And a lot of that's really this like a last mile, um, I'd say, you know, different cities, different jurisdictions, different, uh, you know, sets of permitting. And California has recognized this with EV charging stations, for example, they've, they've set some, a couple laws out there through the assembly, trying to make sure that, um, you know, municipalities will, you know, permit, well and you know streamline permitting processes for charging stations but i think a lot of work could be done you know to this you know listener's question in all aspects of the clean energy transition to make sure that you know the the right incentives and the right mechanisms and the right you know policies are put in place at the city level where these you know decisions are getting made or approved right. to make sure that we're actually getting you know new things approved and permitted and authorized you know quickly and expediently yeah that, that's to be the thing um uh wendy in 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 your in your field, what what do you see is kind of like, I don't know if there's like an overriding climate energy concern. Is there something that kind of jumps up at you kind of over and over? I mean, I, I know a lot of people get stuck with how do I get started? Uh, What's okay. the first step? How do yeah. I do this? Yeah. And um, referring to the Coachella Valley, you know, I didn't know there would be um, an opposition or, you know. Yeah, apparently for a viewer, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I would immediately go to my city or my mayor or whatever and immediately ask them, why are these barriers up? Yeah. Call my electric company. You know, what programs do you have? Most elect electric companies are now incentivized to um, have okay. clean energy or offer yeah. these services. I would think so. Yeah. And um, I'm sure a quick internet search using your zip code or your area would help you with that. But I think most people with respect to um, climate change as a whole, there is a lot of fear around it. And there's a lot of negativity, and I, I really would like people to focus on the positive because there is a there is always an answer, but we have to start acting now. And a lot of times, people love to have conferences, discussions, papers, etc. Sure. 
we have a lot of the the information we have a lot of the technologies and they're only getting better i mean all of these technologies okay. have to be revisited and revamped and fine-tuned that's just an ongoing process but we just need to start rolling it out faster we need to start doing a little bit more that's what i would personally love to see happen yeah to see more of that uh you, you mentioned about incentives we got a, another uh, question from a, a viewer here uh, jeanette d um, maybe this one for you, Aaron. Are there any incentives one could get to pay for public charging stations? Any incentives or tax credits available? So I think the, I, I was kind of curious if this was meant for um, you know paying to build the station or paying to use the station. And the answer is yes to both uh, in okay. some regards. So I'll start with the first one, which is deployment. So as I mentioned, um, you know, for public uh, public fast charging stations, uh, SC and some of the other utilities have customer incentives that will pay for the utility side and, you know, then rebate the, the customer side of that deployment to make sure that it sort of mitigates the cost. Additionally, there's the, oh gosh, the Na National Electric Vehicle in Infrastructure Incentive, the NEVI formula, that's the federal government program out of the IAJA, that really is, you know, set aside to deploy you know, charging public charging stations along uh, transportation corridors. So think like you know interstates, freeways that are you know main 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 arteries, right. uh, on fifty mile increments across the entire country. So there's a lot of money coming to state departments of transportation. So Caltrans then will dole that out to municipalities, cities, developers that want to build those those stations. So that's that's all in the works. Um, additionally, the Air Resources Board here is a wonderful program. The the low carbon fuel standard program, which will pay you know public station developers a uh, I call it if you build it they we will pay you uh, incentive essentially by allowing that's you a to, great incentive isn't it yeah it's a great incentive <laughs> it allows you to kind of capture some of the monetary benefit of participating in the program without actually uh, charging up for a certain time period so as hey it's like we know the charging is going to come you'll make money off of that but in the meantime you know here you can kind of get some a little bit to help pay for your, your construction so a lot out there for the deployment. On the user side, uh, there are currently some pilots in place and some small programs in place, both through the um, Cal, through Caltrans, through a kind of a pilot called the California Integrated Transportation Project. There's through the their uh, California Resources Board has done this as well through a uh, part of their Clean Vehicle Rebate Project program, where they've been providing, uh, you know, basically prepaid debit cards or you know refunding debit cards to help customers that need help paying for public charging costs. Now those have mostly been focused on um, you know lower income customers. But one could imagine, you know, an evolution of something like that if, if you work for an employer or anyone that has a um, you know, like a, a commuter benefits card where you can sort of, you know, put money into a card to help buy train tickets or bus passes or those things. You could imagine a oh, similar okay. type of program doesn't exist yet, but I think the, the groundwork has been laid by those two programs, the, the California ITP and then the um, what's happened in Clean Vehicle Rebate Project, where it's like, hey, here's a way we can prepay something to help you offset the cost of you know paying for public charging. Mm -hmm. So maybe some employers, you know, can can think about that. Um, I know PG&E just proposed in uh, November a similar program where they would you know offer their lower income EV drivers an incentive. We're going to be uh, co-funding that for them once we once we get authorization to do, authorization to do it as well. So I think uh, a lot going on in that in both of those spaces, whether it's as a user or as a developer. Yeah, I mean, especially you mentioned the keyword there, lower income people, helping them out with with this transition. Uh, for Wendy, we got one here. Um, yeah, we talked a little while, a while ago about air purifiers. So uh, viewer uh, uh, Vinny from Los Angeles asked, what would be the best plan of action to get air purifying systems in my kids' schools? Ooh, um, yeah. you, um, if you're in Los Angeles, the LAUSD, I know they have LA United School District. There United you go, yeah. Oh, let's explain all of those little, uh, little acronyms. Yeah. I, I do my best not to talk in acronyms, but they still That's have. All right. um, but, you know, your school district will actually, there's a lot of benefit to get those in the schools. And LAUSD does have a chief sustainability officer. I've met him. He's a wonderful man. And their whole goal is to make the school better resilient, better okay. energy efficiency, cleaner air, cleaner atmosphere, cleaner everything. And, you know, one thing that, um, you know, I'm from the East Coast. One of the things that one of my friends back in New York told me was with respect to air conditioners. So not air purifiers, but conditioners. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in New York were experienced heat stroke or high heat and ending sure. up in the hospital. The healthcare system in New York would buy the air conditioners for certain high risk individuals because it was more cost effective to buy them an air conditioner rather than that, them being in the hospital. Oh, wow. So maybe there's something from the medical industry side, from the healthcare industry side, 
to provide air purifiers. That way, children will not have long-term health issues going forward. Wow. Okay. Just something yeah. to think about. Yeah, and and, and kind of speaks to Advini's concern about the kids in school. I mean, you know, you, if they're getting this kind of bad influence stuff early on, man, it's only going to carry to the rest of their lives. Um, you know, we're, we're getting kind of close to, to the end here, but we got a little more time to, to cover a few more things. Um, you know, in terms of of um, of the programs that are out there uh, for for just kind of the, the clean air idea, uh, not necessarily for EV, but are there other things, uh, Aaron, that that are kind of in the works you could tell us about that kind of are, you know, moving us forward towards this? Oh. Like, like, you know, numbers are getting better, but they can still get better. Right. So absolutely can tell us about Absolutely. I mean, so I think, you know, both the state and and Southern California Edison and the utilities are really, many of the utilities are, are really pushing, I, I mentioned this this broad term called building electrification. Yeah. The only way that comes down to is, you know, there's a lot of applications where uh, combusting a fossil fuel for, you know, maybe drying your clothes or, you know, heating your house to, uh, you know, 70 degrees doesn't make a lot of sense. Well, I think I heard someone on our team say that. It, we're we're combusting a gas at three thousand degree three thousand degrees, so it can be seventy five degrees in your home. And that seems like a really kind of a an awkward use of that that solution. Yes, there's a lot of initiatives now, um, both through the state is running the uh, the tech program, which I think uh, Southern California Edison administers, uh, which is a incentive, kind of an installer's incentives for heat pump water heaters. I mean, that's a that's a thing that has a really you know pernicious air quality, um, you know, negative air quality impact because that that you know, pilot light and the burner on your water heater is probably outside. Uh, it's even worse if it's, if it's inside, but you know, it's, it's just on all the time, uh, just slowly burning and, you know, creating, um, you know, emissions benefits, you know, not benefits, emissions problems from that air quality problems. You've got, you know, you know, kind of those issues. So there's a lot of programs in the state today uh, that also the utility is sponsoring independently that are trying to support the deployment of, you know, the, or the phase out of, gas water heaters, of gas dryers, of, you know, even just, you know, older, you know, less efficient, you know, you know air conditioning units uh, for heat pump systems. And that's a, that's a strange term. I'll, I'll spend a second on it. I mean, heat yeah. pumps, like it's, uh, oh, I don't need a heater. I need an air conditioner. They, they, they do both. And if, if you have a refrigerator, you're very familiar with the heat pump. Uh, that's exactly what operates a refrigerator. Uh, it's just a, it's just a mechanism of moving heat or cool energy. I'd say heat energy from one place to the other. They're incredibly efficient. Yeah. Um, even, even so forth that, you know, you will, you more than likely will see, you know, a, a bill reduction, uh, generally speaking from switching from a, you know, traditional HVAC system to a, a heat pump, just because the modern appliances are, are really, really incredible. So there, there are a number of those processes in the state. There's also a heck of a lot of, uh, either tax cut, you know, tax, uh, credits, uh, and direct pay tax rebates out of the inflation reduction act that was passed back in 2022. So I think the best um, resource I found for that is uh, pluginamerica.org. I think it's .org. They have a, a little tool it's like how much could you save from the IRA where, again, you can put in your zip code, you can put in your, you know, annual household income and your household size, you know, just kind of type in rough numbers right. and it'll tell you you're eligible for, you know, XYZ tax credit or you are, you know, you also eligible for, you know, ABC, you know, tax rebate. And here's where you can go to find more information about it. So if you're, that, and that's mostly for things around your home, it's for, you know, insulation, air conditioning, uh, heat pump, water heaters, it's for installing EV charging stations at your home. So a lot of great money coming our way from the federal government uh, and, and some really good resources out there to help you find what you're eligible for. Right. Uh, you know, uh, Wendy, I was, I was you know, looking back at my notes here a little bit, you know, your job is the chief climate risk and communication communications officer for uh, navigating gray. Uh, tell us about navigating gray. Ah, so um, that's a really good story. I'm so glad you asked me. Yeah. So um, they're a management consulting firm, but they also focus on socioeconomic impact and technology. And the only reason I found these guys was I interviewed him for my own webcast. Oh. I loved what he did primarily because he brought in his 16 year old daughter as a co-founder. He wanted his daughter to learn business. And I'm like, this is an amazing man. Yeah. And I couldn't get him out of it in my head. So I just kept kind of revisiting his website and what they were doing. And I finally reached out to him and said, can I be a part of this? Like, I mean, they're based in Charlotte, North Carolina. I said, I really, yeah. I want to be a part of what you're doing. Yeah. And he was like, awesome. I need someone in California. And um, originally the focus was on environmental social governance, helping people understand what that means. Socioeconomic impact, which just means making equity available to everyone. And then they realized data. And I'm, I'm a you know science nerd, data. 
data is so important. And again, so yeah. many of these people, so many companies use estimates or averages for an entire community rather than that granular data. Right. That he started building an application that will hopefully be launched in February, where we will be able to gather that granular data from communities within communities. So no strangers, no street teams, no, you know, nothing like within your community, people capturing information that can be used to make things better. The whole point is to find out what's working, what's not working and improve it. So the man's amazing. His name's Irvin Sloan. He's he's fantastic. Yeah. Well, that, and then glad they got you involved too. And it sounds like it's kind of doing what it's supposed to be doing. Uh, also, of course, uh, we were talking about you know sponsored by the American Lung Association. I got to tell you about this. Uh, uh, this program we do here is called Community Connections. It's a free resource made available via fundraising events uh, like uh, an upcoming Fight for Air Climb. It's at the LA Memorial Coliseum this year. It's on February 25th, and uh, LA very excited to some of the panelists here and their companies are supporters of the event. Thank you for that, both of you. Uh, and in fact, my place, ABC7 here is a proud sponsor, and we'll be having a big team ourselves once again. Uh, and of course, we'd love you to climb with us or make your own team as well. Uh, there's a link in the chat here if you want to join in. More questions, you can email uh, greaterla uh, greater, greater LA at lung.org, and that'll be a way for you to get involved with the uh, free climbs. Uh, I also now want to thank my, my panelists. You guys are wonderful. I mean, their info uh, your insight, all truly, truly appreciated. So uh, thank you, Aaron Dyer from the Customer Program Services for Southern California Edison and Wendy Nystrom, uh, the host of Environmental Social Justice and the Chief Climate Risk and Communications Officer for Navigating Grade. Both of you, thank you for your time and your incredible and very, very useful information. We truly appreciate you guys today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. <laughs> thank you, Danny, and thank you to the American Lung Association. Thank all you right, you guys. Much. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a great day. Stay safe. Breathe some clean air. See you next time. <laughs>